curiosity. God is faithful. For mothers with little ones who are living between the beauty of being a mom and the feeling of not doing enough, God is faithful. For moms with teenagers who exist in the push and pull of being too near and not being near enough, God is faithful. For moms in the empty nest, who are living in the tension of will they be okay and the honesty of did I do okay, God is faithful. For grandmothers who are living every day with devotion, worry, wisdom, and a lot of praying, God is faithful. So let's make this a day of celebrating mothers and also a day of declaring the faithfulness of God over them. God is faithful to fulfill his promises. He's faithful to make a way where there seems to be no way. He's faithful to be the light when our faith grows dim and to be the song when we're too exhausted to sing. God is faithful to love us, carry us, form us, and restore us. And the very same God who has begun this good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. All because he is faithful. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning, Victory. How are we today? Awesome, awesome. I love the energy. It feels electric in the atmosphere. It feels like I'm on a WWE stage. I love it. Let's keep it going. Now, if we can go ahead and just do something really quick. If you all could just rise for one quick moment. Just indulge me. Just rise for one quick moment. Go ahead and say, it's nice to see you to somebody with a little special twist. If you see a mother there, go ahead and tell her, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, bro. Yeah. We're not going to go there. <laughs> it's, it's not funny if we do it the other way. <laughs> awesome, awesome, guys. We can go ahead now and just return to our seats slowly. Returning to our seats. Beautiful fellowship that I see there. Awesome. Chase killed it this time. I say I saw him say hi to like five people. It was insane. Man had his hand out every single way. It's crazy. All right. Awesome. So first things first, of course, it's Mother's Day. We want to go ahead and just from the stage also just say happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. And now as we shift over to the announcements, first things first is we have our church program right here in my hand is a church program. As you can see, there's a little tear-off sheet right on the top of my microphone. That tear-off sheet is something that is a resource to you. There you can go ahead and fill that out. You can get plugged into our church community, request information regarding a small group, request information regarding a prayer as well. It's a great way, and I encourage every single person here to fill that out. We all have a need on our heart. We all have some type of just want to connect. And that's a way to do that. So I encourage you to go ahead and just fill that out. Once you tear it off, you can just go ahead into the go drop box right by Pastor Dave, right by Will, and you can drop it off there. So we can go ahead and collect it and see what's going on, how we can get you plugged in. Next up, we have a little uh, welcome present for any newcomers here today. Right by the resource table, we have our victory tumblers. Those are available to you if you're a newcomer. If you're not, I will be there and I will tackle you. You can't touch it. No, of course not. But if you are a newcomer, that's our gift to you. So go ahead, the resource table in the back. In addition to that resource, we always say resource table. I always say resource table. You've heard me say the Tumblr announcement many times, but I want to highlight something about the resource table that's very important. So part of us as a church that we want to go ahead and advance is to be able to not just say we have resources, but put, to put that into action. One of the resources we have available, if I can go ahead and find the name, it's called Right Now Media. There is a little sheet right available in the back. If you are a regular visitor here, that is a resource to you. What is Right Now Media? Why is it important? Why is he talking about it? Why can't we just do worship right now? Like, what's going on? The thing is, Right Now Media is a great resource. It's essentially Christian Netflix. And before you guys are thinking, oh, man, Christian Netflix, like... 
I've seen Netflix, and Netflix sometimes is showing some mid stuff, some stuff that isn't really good. So I'm not really too keen on watching Christian Netflix. Well, it's not necessarily just these dramas that really don't go anywhere. It's great resources, educational, great ways to get plugged in, great advice. It also has some series that you can really just dive into, and it's just something that blesses your life. One thing that I'd like to share is when it comes to Christian media, it's kind of going into a bit of a golden age. When I was growing up, Christian media wasn't very good. I remember watching it, and it was always a stale imitation of something in the world. I, I remember looking at shirts at a Christian store when I was a kid, and I love Call of Duty. It's a video game. And then it said, Call to Faith. And I'm like, oh, oh, geez, that's like, can we think of something more creative? But that's not the case anymore. Christian media is flourishing. If anybody here has seen The Chosen, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know how Christian media has been elevated. And that's another resource that I encourage you to go ahead and just jump on. That's available to all of our regular visitors, and it's at the resource table. The last thing I'm going to go ahead and share with you guys is going to be regarding our small groups. We always share that if you're not part of a small group, your church experience is what? Let's do that again. If you're not part of a small group, your church experience is? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Miss Marcia gets double points. She answered it twice the right way. So we share that because it's very important. Community is something that's key to our lives as Christians, and that's the way we can participate in that. We have many small groups that are going to be starting up. More information is going to be shared at the resource table. But I can make one announcement regarding a small group. Now, we're going to be having our men's group meeting. It's going to be this Thursday, May 18th at 6.30 p.m. I'm going to repeat that for all the guys out there. And then all the women in your life that maybe be like, you need to go. Like, get, get, get your butt into men's group now. So if you have that, this is the information. Men's night, Thursday, May 18th at 6.30 p.m. It's going to be at a house in Buena Park. If you want more information to get plugged in regarding the address, because I could list the address to you right now and you're not going to remember, go ahead and look at the resource table. Ask Pastor Dave, ask myself, and we'll get you plugged in. Or... You know what else we can do? We can fill out this little sheet and drop it off there, and we'll just send the information right to you. It's crazy how it works. But let's go ahead now, and let's just rise to our feet as we worship the Lord. You give and take away 
you give and take away my heart will choose to say lord blessed be your name you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say lord blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. to worship here I am 
nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out you would cross an ocean so i wouldn't try you've never been closer than you are right now because you are driver you are Circumstance, cause you are Chira. You are enough, forever enough, always enough, more than enough. Forever enough, always enough, more than enough. Mountaintop, I could see so clear what it's all about. So stay by my side when the sun goes down. Don't wanna forget how I feel right now. Gyra, Gyra, you are enough. Circumstance, Jaira, you are enough. Forever enough, always enough, more than enough. Forever enough, always enough, more than enough. I'm already loved, I'm already chosen. You've spoken. I'm already loved more than I could imagine. And that is enough. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. I know what I am. I know what you've spoken. I'm already loved.
much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you if he watches over every sparrow? How much more does he love you? How much more? It's more than you ask, think or imagine. According to his power, working in us. It's more than enough. It's more than you ask, think or imagine. According to his power, working in us. It's more than enough. We call you Jairo. You are enough. Thanks, guys. That was beautiful. Love that song. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. To all the moms out there, I should say. Happy Mother's Day. We're so excited that you chose to worship with us on Mother's Day. And as we look to honor moms, we asked a handful of people in our church what they love about their moms. I'm going to get us started just reading a few of those to you. These are anonymously that I'm reading them. I love my mom's helpful heart. Isn't it true that moms always have a helpful heart ready to serve their children and their family? Someone else said, I love my mom's carefree spirit, independence, and audacity. <laughs> I love that. That's beautiful. I love the way my mom cared for her family. Growing up, she made sure we all had what we needed. And I always loved to see her light up when we were all together. She loved having people over and visiting. I sure do miss her. It's been eight years since she passed. I love my mom's home-cooked meals. Who loves their mom's home-cooked meals? Nothing like mom's, mom's meals, huh? My mom is passed, but I loved the way she always had confidence in me when nobody else did. What a testimony to a great mom. I remember the day my mom, the day my mom passed. I remember waking up that morning. We were still in San Francisco, and it was the day that we were actually moving back to moving back here to Southern California. And she, mom had died the day before. And I remember that next morning when I woke up. It was, uh, what was that, August 1st, 2014. July 31st? Okay. July 31st, 2014. My wife knows better than me. I remember waking up that morning, and I was getting ready, and we were getting ready to, to drive. And we were going to drive the 420 miles to, from San Francisco to Long Beach to our new home. And I remember looking in the mirror as I was brushing my teeth, and I thought to myself, wow, this is the first day that my mom's not here. And if nobody else was for me, my mom was always for me. She was my biggest fan. And man, that was like a monumental day thinking, mom's no longer here. Amazing. We want to be able to honor all of our moms. Some of us, our moms are no longer with us. But plenty of us, our moms are here right now. And so we just want to take a few minutes to honor you mothers. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you do. We thank you for what you've done. You'll always be your children's mom, whether for your adult children, just, it's just different than when they were little babies and you go through the, these phases when they're teenagers and then when they grow up and you send them off out to start their own families. But we want to take a moment to 
recognize moms. If you, wouldn't, if you would indulge us, moms, all the moms, if you'll stand up and rise, and, and we have a gift that the guys in the back are going to bring to you. All the moms who stand up. Online folks, sorry, we, we, we wish you were here because we'd have a gift for you too. We love you guys. We recognize all the moms. So just stay standing for just a moment as, as we recognize the, you beautiful moms and the guys are, yes, thank you. And I also want to say, remind you that outside we have a lovely photo spot. Please be sure and go by there and take a picture, even if your kids aren't here today. Moms, get out there. Ladies, get out there. Um, everybody who's here, get out there, take a picture. We'll have somebody out there taking pictures, and um, those will be posted later today on our Facebook page, Victory Anaheim, so you'll be able to uh, grab them off of our Facebook page, so be sure and go there. Stay standing for just a quick moment as the guys are bringing you a, a little gift to say, moms, you're amazing. You are amazing for what you do, for what you've done, for who you are. We love you so much. It's all right. I just wanted to wait till everybody has a gift, and then I want to say a, a prayer of blessing over the moms. Online and in person, we just want to bless you as, as mothers. All right. Will you join me in prayer as we bless these moms right now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the distinct role of woman, wife, mother. We thank you for these women and the role that they've played in the lives of their children. Lord, it's so important, the role of a mom. It's an expression of your love that's poured out uniquely through mothers. And Lord, I pray that you would bless each mom here. I pray that they would feel honored today because they deserve it. I pray that their children would honor them, their husbands would honor them, the people in their lives would honor them and bless them. Lord, I pray that their days would go long, their health would be full. Lord, I pray that their household would be filled with joy and laughter. We love the mothers in our lives. We, we're so thankful for our moms. Pray that you bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Well, today we're going to take a break from our series on 1 Peter, and I would like to bring you a message that is specifically geared toward moms. It's not just for moms, but it's about moms. And... Um, I want to begin by, by saying that every family has its own way of creating health and happiness and joy and making things happen. This is a picture of my mom and dad with my older sister and myself. I'm the little boy that my mom is holding, the chubby little boy that my mom is holding there. I think by the time I was three months, I weighed 30 pounds, they told me. So I was a big, big boy. And what's that? 23? 23? Oh, see that? I'm always exaggerating about stuff. But that's still big. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's one of the things the ladies in my life always correct me on stuff that I'm... You know. So my mom and dad, just, just give you a, a little glimpse of, of how families come together and, and make things happen. My mom and dad, this was a picture where my dad came to visit us. My mom and dad weren't together, so we would see our dad every once in a while. And when I think of my early years, I think of how I was raised, and it was, there, it was, it was a, several women in, in my life that were like mother figures to me. It was my mom Mom would work two jobs, and sometimes she, there, she, she actually worked three jobs. But So mom was always busy in raising, um, raising us. My older sister is in, in, in the back there, and one of my older sisters is in the back. Hi, Sandra. And so the, she's the other one in the picture. So our oldest sister, she's not in this picture. but um, So mom would work really hard, 
And then she would rely on grandma to help in raising us. So grandma lived across the street, Grandma Garcia. And, and so her house was kind of catty corner from us. And, and um, so we would, we would had grandma in our lives. And then later on, grandma came and lived with us. Those early years, I also remember my older sister that she was thrust into a place where she had to help raising um, Sandra and I, our older sister. She was, what is, what's Linda, 10 years older than you? Nine than you and 10 years older than me. And she would, as a teenager, helping. And, and I remember we also had another cousin, a cousin Rachel, that was helping. And so the, all these ladies that kind of pulled together, that they, they were there to help raise um, our Sandra and myself. And that was an important part of those, those early years. And families, you find a way to make it happen. Um, my mom is a single mom. She relied on her grandma and her, and her older daughter, my sister Linda. And that's the beautiful thing about family, that you find a way to make it happen. You find a way to make your, your family special. And there's an actress by the name of Sophia Loren. Anybody ever heard of Sophia Loren? Okay. <laughs> Sophia Loren. She said this about motherhood. When you're a mother, you are never really alone in your thoughts. A mother always has to think twice. Once for herself and once for her child. Oprah Winfrey said this, I believe the choice to become a mother is the choice to become one of the greatest spiritual teachers there is. Moms, let me ask you a question. Do you feel like a great spiritual teacher to your children? Do you? Do you feel like you're a great spiritual teacher to your children? Um, this is a high view of motherhood. And you think about, about the phases of motherhood. Um, it may not feel very noble to be a mom when you're changing diapers, Chloe, right? <laughs> when you're changing diapers, it doesn't feel very noble. Um, when you're giving baths and, and dealing with the trouble that your child caused in school, it doesn't feel very noble. When you're having to discipline your child, it doesn't feel very noble. But I believe that it is a great responsibility and that I agree with Oprah that a mother is one of the greatest spiritual teachers. And I want to bring this message to you. This message is called Born for Greatness. And it's a tribute to the role of mothers, um, but also wives. And um, as I get started with it, will you join me in prayer? Our God and our Father, as we get into your word right now, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds and draw us into the healing words that come from the scripture. I pray that we would be able to receive a vision for families, marriage, and parenting from you and what your word says, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would guide our steps and bless each of these moms. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so the first part of this message is called Me Versus Us. Me Versus Us. I'm going to read a, a, a scripture in a minute from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, and I want to set it up by saying that the Bible opens with Genesis chapter 1 and the story of creation. God created the world. And before God created, God made an us decision. God made an us decision. And let's look at what the scripture says about that us decision. So from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the us that it talks about, it says, God said, let us. 
So God said, let us. The us that it speaks of there is Father, Son, and Spirit. So Father, Son, and Spirit made an us decision. And before we talk about wives and mothers, before we talk about husbands and fathers, um, we, 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 we want to start at the beginning. In the beginning, there was God, and God created the, the heavens and the earth. In order to properly understand the human condition, the role of families, the institution of marriage, the role of a wife, the role of a mother, in order to properly understand them, we must acknowledge the beginnings as stated in the Bible. Everything began with God. It began in the mind of God. And God shows us how to make decisions in, in, in this scripture, God made an us decision between Father, Son, and Spirit. And from there, He created man and woman in the image of God. And this decision was in no way a me decision. It was an us decision. Men sometimes make the mistake of thinking that they are the man, so all their decisions that they're making in their family go through them, and they make the decision. I'm the man. I know what I'm doing. Listen to me. Nothing could be farther from the truth in a biblical marriage. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, I would say this. I personally, Dave Lanto Jr., I've brought a lot of pain into my marriage by my me decisions by the me decisions. You can ask Marcia. Sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I brought pain into her marriage because, you know, I'll, I'll come home and I'll tell her something I did and she's going, she's got this look on her face and she's like thinking like, what did you do now? What's the next thing he's going to say? And um, I, I, when, when I bought a business, it was a me decision. One time I bought, I bought a car and I said, look at the car I bought. It was a me decision. And um, we had our conversations, we had our escalated conversations, I would say, escalated heated conversations about some of my me decisions. And every time I brought a me decision, I created pain for my wife or my family. Me decisions in a marriage always bring pain. They always bring pain. And, and so... Um, Without fail, when I've made me decisions, it caused pain to those I love. Happy marriages are built on strong us decisions, always. Happy marriages are built on strong us decisions, but me decisions destroy marriages. I can thank God that my marriage is still going. My wife is, my wife is very graceful. Me is filled with pressure, isolation, stress. And fear. Me decisions are always filled with, with isolation, fear, pressure, and stress. Um, marriages can't s seem to stay on the same page when they're filled with me decisions. The husband and wife are always in disagreement and always having, um, they're fighting a lot. And they don't respect each other when it's filled with me decisions. But us decisions are characterized by intimacy and equality. And marriages filled with us are happy, and they're optimistic, and they work through their struggles together. They always find a way to work through their struggles together. So I wanted to start off this message by looking at God and seeing that God set an example for humanity in, in making us decisions. And, and so... I heard not too long ago, I was listening to a podcast, sometimes I listen to Joe Rogan's podcast, and he was talking about marriage, and they, 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 he had somebody on, and they were talking particularly about gay marriage, and Joe Rogan made a statement, he said, hey, marriage is a human creation, so what does it matter, you know, what somebody gets married, whatever, you know, gender they are, or, or it, you know, if two men or two women want to get married, what does it matter? And that's fine, that's fine. But I would disagree with Joe Rogan on his starting point. He said marriage is a human creation. But the Bible tells us that marriage is from God. And so we shouldn't look to create marriage in our image or however we want. We look to God because he's the one who set the rules 
for what marriage looks like. So we look to God for our example. We don't make the rules ourselves. And so we're the created, so we look to our creator for wisdom, for guidance. And that's why going to the Bible, so I wanted to start off by, by looking at us decision. And I promise you, no matter what your marriage looks like today, if you will make us decisions in, 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 in a community of that marriage, husband and wife is two equal partners making us decisions, your marriage will be revolutionized, it will be so much better. So much more at peace, so much healthier, so much respect. Second part of this message, created in the image of God. It, it told us in that scripture we just read that the us decision was to make male and female in the image of God. That was the us decisions that God made. So Tina Fey said this about mom, momhood. Being a mom has made me so tired and so happy. So tired and so happy. Any moms can relate to that? So tired and so happy? <laughs> Being a mom is tiring work for sure every day. When our children were small, there were times when Marcia would, when I'd come home from work and she'd, I remember this in particular with Connor, and I, I know I've, I've told this story here before, but I'd come home and Marcia would be done with Connor. No offense, Connor. We love you. She'd be like, I'm wiped with Connor. And she, she, would just, she just started looking at me, and she's like, Dave, I need you to go have, take Connor right now. <laughs> she's like, she had like, it was like this urgency and directness that I was like, yeah, would it, whatever I had in mind right now, I'm taking Connor. That's just how it's going to be. <laughs> And so I'd be like, okay, what's going, you know, and Connor was, was so our little guy that was filled with so much energy and he's just all over the place. And, and so I started doing this thing where I'd go like, we got to get some of Connor's energy out of him. So we'd run around the block. So we lived on a hill. It was one of the highest hills in San Francisco. And so I would take him around the block. And so we'd head straight down the block. It was straight. And then we'd go down a block and then over and then up. And the up, that's the hard part. And that was a steep hill. We lived on, on what's called Mount Davidson in San Francisco, which is the highest peak. And, and so after doing that run with Connor, then it's like Connor comes in and he's like, he's like okay, come on, Connor, we're going to go for a race. And we just run. And uh, he, he's, he's calmed down and, and, and a lot, lot more bearable after that. Connor, you're a lot more chill now. <laughs> Yes, he is. Connor's a good young man. Um, so every parent, you, you, yeah, I never hold it against a mom for losing control with their babies, with their sons, with their daughters. There's those times where you just like, you had enough and you blow up. And um, I just wanna, wanted to remind you that moms, you were created in the image of God. You have what it takes to do what you're meant to do, to raise your kids at every phase of their lives, to be the mom that your children need at every phase of their lives, from, from babyhood to childhood to teenagers to adults. You have what it takes, moms, to relate to them and speak into them. And you know what? Sometimes your adult children need you to speak into them, and you are created with the intent and design, it was, it was God's intention in his, that, that every man and woman would be created in His image. And, and so every marriage should reflect the image of God. That's what, one of the things we learned from the Scripture, that every marriage should reflect the image of God. In Acts 17.24, it says this, Acts 17.24 from the English Standard Version, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth. In Genesis 1, the image of God is likened to exercised dominion over the other creatures of creation. Humanity in the image of God is endowed with the authority to rule 
as God's representatives. I'm giving you some theology that informs how you live life. So from Genesis 1, we learn this, that because we're created in the image of God, we are endowed with the authority to rule the earth as God's representatives. Some ways that the image of God plays out in human beings is our ability to reason, the morality that we hold ourselves to, language, the capacity for relationships that are governed by love and commitment, and our creative abilities. All of these things are reflections of the image of God. Who has a cat at their house? Who has a dog at their house? Your dogs and cats are not created in the image of God. They have none of these things that I just mentioned. Your dogs and cats have none. You love them. They're beautiful. They're amazing. You love having them around. But they have none of these things that I just mentioned. They don't have the kind of morality that you have. They don't have the ability to reason that you have. They don't have the capacity for relationships that are governed by love and commitment. I just imagine my cat. Hey, kitty cat, Luna, we have this relationship that's governed by our, our mutual love and commitment for each other, right, Luna? No. Luna's like, I'm hungry, feed me. I'll lay on you when I, when, when I want to. She thinks she owns us. You know, she walks around thinking she owns the place. And, but there, her, our, the relationship is not governed by commitment or love. Moms, all of your image of God capabilities are needed in your parenting. They're needed in your parenting of your younger children, your teenage children especially, but also your adult children. At every stage, you matter for your children. Your children care about what you think. They care about your opinion, and they need your opinion. Um, even when you don't feel like giving it to them, your children need what you have. You're important, and you're needed for the sake of your children, and for the sake of your family, and really for the sake of society. So much of the brokenness that you see in society, like, when I look at society, I go, man, there's a lot of reasons that I go, we're broken. We are broken. But that brokenness started in houses, in households, in families that were broken. It started in broken families because a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, don't operate by God's ways. It's like what, 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 what I said about that podcaster earlier where he's going like, hey, marriage was created by humanity, so we get to do like whatever we want with marriage. No. Marriage was created by God. Abide by God's laws, by God's ways and you'll have a healthy marriage, you'll have a healthy family, and you'll have healthy societies. Where societies break down is where people depart from God. And so I find that many Christians don't even apply God's ways to their, their families and their, and their marriage life. And it, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. Christians need to operate by God's ways. So our world is in trouble and our world needs strong marriages, strong moms, strong families, so we can have a great society. Healthy families begin with happy marriages, for sure. Healthy families begin with happy marriages. And the problem is that most people don't know the true purpose of marriage. How would you go, well, why did you get married? I have my purpose for why I got married. What about big picture? Do you know God's purpose for marriage? Are you aware of God's purpose for marriage? If I ask any one of you, if we're having a conversation, I go, hey, tell me God's purpose for marriage. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Are you going to like um, pull something out of like, oh, I think it's this. You know how you answer a question or you answer a question with a question like, uh, is it blah? And you start saying an answer and that's, you know, you're guessing. You're just guessing. Do Christians know God's purpose for marriage? Well, hopefully you're thinking about that and you're wondering what exactly is God's purpose for marriage? 
And is anybody wondering about that? Can I share that with you? Is that all right if I share with you God's purpose for marriage? Okay. So it's a fair question to ask, what is God's design for marriage? And the scripture tells us some important things that we need to know about God. So I'm going to read a scripture from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about love. And when you're talking about a definition of love, don't look to anywhere but the Scriptures, because God is love, and our ability to love comes from God. The world says love is love, so let love be whatever love is. That's not God's standard. That's not God's standard. If you want to know what love does, read 1 Corinthians 13. And and, and the best definition I've ever heard of love is this. Love seeks the well-being of the object of that love. So whatever you love, you will seek their well-being. Whoever you love, you will seek their well-being. You will never do harm. That's why 1 Corinthians talks about love does no harm. It goes on and on about love is patient, kind, gentle, long-suffering. And, and so um, love, it, it, the, the, the crazy thing is that 1 Corinthians actually says that everything is meaningless without love. But it's not talking about the love that the world gives. It's talking about the love that God gives, the love that is rooted in God, where it says right here in this scripture we're talking about, God is love. So we need to tap into the love that it's talking about here. So um, one of my friends and mentors, uh, Bud McCord, he describes this in this way. The image of God is an ongoing environment of sustained love. So he describes the image of God. You know how we're created in the image of God? Okay, Bud describes it this way. It's in his book. You guys who've gone through marriage meetings with me, you guys know I go through this book with you, um, Bud's book, um, Six Metaphors of a Happy Marriage, which is amazing. And um, the image of God is an ongoing environment of sustained love. God is endless love. Within the Trinity is endless love, or this endless love is continuously sustained. It is this constant existence of love that sustains the universe right now. This constant existence of love is actually sustaining the universe. So that's why 1 Corinthians tells us that everything is meaningless without love, the love of God. And and so from a biblical perspective, marriages exist to make available on earth what constantly exists in the Trinity, and that is sustained love. So God made a plan so that every single person on earth, if they will abide by God's ways, every man and woman, when they get married, they start having children, if they'll abide, if their marriage will be by God's ways, their children and everyone in their influence will experience sustained love through that couple. Sustained love through that couple. And, and there's, a, there's a thing about love that love is not in short supply. Like, if you pour out love into, into someone, it's not like you go like, oh, man, well, I'm not going to have enough love for someone else. No. Love, as you root yourself in Christ, is constantly rejuvenated, constantly sustained, constantly happening. You never, it's a never-ending resource. You don't have to be scarce with love. Pour out love in the world. The world needs love. Love seeks the well-being of the object of that love. Pour out love into the world. Seek the well-being of people. And um, I want to, last part, I want to talk about male and female from the Scripture. So in the first two chapters of the Bible, before sin entered into the picture, the subject is marriage in the first two chapters of the Bible. This tells us something very important about marriage and that it's part of God's larger plan for the world. 
So let's take a look at how God's plan unfolded. In Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to read several verses from 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. I will make a helper fit for him. Verse 19. Now out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Verse 20. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. For, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, over one of, while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So verse 23, um, we need to applaud Adam here. We need to applaud Adam in verse 23 because he immediately embraced Eve's presence and perfection as the key to all future human progress and expansion. As soon as the Lord brought Eve to him, Adam was excited. He goes, yes, because he knew that among all the animals, he's like, yeah, I'm alone. Uh, these dogs are nice, but yeah, here, Fido, go catch the stick. You know, these, these, these um, giraffes are amazing. These lions, wow. All these fish, amazing, but mm, there's no one like me here. That's why it says there was not found a, su a suitable helper for Adam. And when, when um, the Lord did something here, he wanted Adam to see that he was incomplete. He wanted Adam to see that he needed someone more to complete his life. And, and so Adam was feeling the, the, the loneliness of, wow, all these animals are amazing, but I'm alone. I'm alone. And so as soon as God creates Eve, Adam immediately lights up and gets excited. He gets all excited. He embraces her, and she was what was missing in his life for the delivery of God's love and for the image of God to appear. And so Eve became Adam's helper, his companion, his equal in revealing the image of God as sustained love. So one major difference between men and women, there's so many, but one major difference I just want to highlight is that men see everything from the outside in. So they, they view life from the public to the private. So you know how you, you, you have all these ways that you say, I've, I've got my public life and I've got my uh, private life. And you go, hey, yeah, yeah I, I go to work, public, but I don't bring my work home, private. And, and sometimes when you bring your work home, private, that's a problem. And for the wife, when a husband brings his work home into the private home, it's a problem. It's a problem. And so because wives, women, see things from the inside out. And so uh, I, Marcia and I used to run into this where I would go, I would be out and about doing, you know, meeting people and doing what I do. And then I'd go, hey, Marcia, I, I invited so-and-so over for dinner. They're coming over for dinner tomorrow night. And she would be like, um, okay, it would have been nice to get some heads up. And she, you know, after a while, like we, we did that. And after a while, she would start getting stressed out and she would go, okay, look, we got to change something up here. When you do that... It stresses me out because I don't want to have anybody come to the house and the house be messy at all. I want everything to be clean, orderly, no dishes out, no um, laundry, all the laundry done, the bathroom's clean, and you're not giving me enough time to get that done. And by the way, you're not giving me enough help to get that done. And, and so 
I'm just operating publicly. Hey, 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 we're having these people over. She's operating privately. She's going, what are you doing? We can't have people over with a messy, ugly house. It wasn't ugly, but you get the idea. Um, and, and so that's an example of private and public right there and, and how we think differently. And, and so I, I just want to say that, um, I, I highlight a couple other things as I close this one out. So in this scripture, I'm just going to highlight a few things that I think are important for us to take and recognize. In verse 18, God said it was not good that man was alone. It was not good. Elsewhere in Genesis, the Lord looked at creation and saw that it was good. He saw the animals, saw that it was good. The fish, the birds, saw that it was good. The worlds, the heavens, everything, and it was good. But there was one thing that God said was not good. He said, it's not good that man should be alone in verse 18. Also in verse 18, we see that men and women are meant to complement and complete one another in the image of God, in the image of God. So a man alone doesn't reflect the full image of God. A woman alone doesn't reflect the full image of God. We need each other to reflect the full image of God and to transfer the image of God into those whom we love. So the, the, the love that your children receive from their dad is different from the love that they receive from their mom, and they need both to complete the image of God. And by the way, a married couple, you need each other to fully deliver love even to other people in your life. You don't fully, like when, you, when, it, when a couple is together, it's like, oh yeah, Dave and Marcia, yes. Yes, Dave, that's, that's a thing together. That's, we're together. We deliver love together to people in our lives in a way that we couldn't alone. And to, to our friends, to our church, to our family members, our, to anybody who knows us. And, and so that's an important thing. Verse 18 tells us that men and women are meant to complement one another in delivery of love in the image of God. Verse 24 says, a man leaves his parents and embraces his wife. They become one. That's a huge deal. There has to be a disconnect from the parents, from the parents. And, and you, this is an unhealthy thing that you see when, when, a, when, when parents have too much influence in their married children's lives, it's a problem. You can do that for a season, but you can't sustain it for the long haul. Um, and and it's, it's an important thing that, that, that marriages have to stand on their own. They have to stand on their own. Verse 25, a marriage is the image of God. A marriage is the image of God. The couple is completely open and vulnerable with each other, and there was no shame. If there's anybody that you can be completely vulnerable with, it needs to be your spouse. A husband and a wife together. Complete vulnerability. No secrets. Not hiding. No pretense completely vulnerable. And it says that they were naked and they were not ashamed. And that represents everything about what's best in a marriage when a man and wife can be completely vulnerable with each other. And I want to say that these, these scriptures, as I kind of close this out, I want to draw us to a point of prayer in a moment, that these scriptures paint a picture for not only marriage, but the role of a mom, the role of a dad. And take your cues from God, not from society. You may have had bad examples growing up from your own parents, and don't hold that against them. They did the best that they could. But maybe they didn't know what the Word of God teaches. But we're talking about biblical theology, and it's important. Your theology matters. What you believe matters. And so you take these, you're like, am I going to... Um, if, if something that I've said here, that all this comes from Scripture, that doesn't jive with your thinking, then you have to go, okay, I'm just going to discount it, or you go, well, I'm going to study it further in the Word of God to see how that applies to my life, to see how I can make those beliefs my own. And, you know, I say don't just take my word for it. 
I've done this quickly and given you a snapshot in this message here on Mother's Day to honor moms, but I want to say that do your biblical study. Do your study of the Bible. Get into the Word yourself so you can understand these concepts and, and, and study it with other people, who, other Christians who will study it with you and, and to find what it, what it means to be uh, uh, married, to be a mom, to be a dad that is in God's way. You who are thinking about getting married, study the Bible to see what it says so you can apply these things to your life. It's important. Study it for your life. Make these principles part of your life. Will you join me in prayer? Our God and our Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for every mom that's here. I'm so thankful for the role of mother that you created with intention and specific design to deliver love together with a husband, with a father. And Lord, I pray, God, that Lord, I know my words are frail, but Lord, I trust that the meaning comes out strong because it's your word. And Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray, God, that you help us to live by your word and apply your word to our lives, God. I pray that we would be filled with blessing and happy marriages as we follow your ways, Lord. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that wants to explore this more life with God... I just want to speak to anybody who that, who's like that. You want to keep your eyes closed, your heads bowed. If there's anybody that you want to explore this more, we want to help you do that. Life with God is what you're meant for. Your creator wants to be with you, to be um, supportive of you, and to help you live life in a healthy way. And so if there's anyone that you want more information about that or you want to put your faith in God, it begins with Jesus, that we trust Jesus with our lives. And, and um, if you're ready to walk across the line of faith, it's a simple thing that begins the journey. And that simple thing is to put your life in the hands of God, in the hands of Jesus. So you could do that with a simple prayer, Jesus, I give my life to you. Jesus, I give my life to you. And I trust you to lead me and guide me in living life with you. Amen. Will you stand to your feet as we sing?
every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. great to be gathered to church. That is such a beautiful song. It almost has me in tears every single time I hear it. It's gorgeous. You may all take a seat for this quick little moment. So one quick thing I want to share before we do our little closing. First things first is we still have our Mother's Day festivities up and running. We have a little photo booth out in the back, out in the patio. I'm so sorry. And then we also have some snacks, some great donuts. That's for all of us here to enjoy. Take your photos with your moms. They want them. I don't really like photos myself. I hate photos, but my mom gets a lot of freebies throughout the year. Her birthday, my birthday, Christmas, Mother's Day, and it's Mother's Day. So she gets a freebie, she gets unlimited photos of me. And I'm sure a lot of moms out there are thinking the same thing. So cash in on that, Mother's Day, take as many photos as you'd like. So now as I shift things towards uh, just a reflection on the message, if anybody accepted Jesus today, I wanna welcome you to the family of God. As I always say, I repeat it, and sometimes I hesitate to think, like, should I keep saying the same thing? But it's the same thing, but it's the right thing to say that it's the start of a beautiful journey. It's not just a decision, and we're called to walk that together. Now, as uh, I can shift 
into a point of offering, we have two ways to give. But before I talk about the offering itself and the ways we can do that, I want to share why it's important. Something I've shared in the past is that we give, we're called to give because Christ gave it all for us. So we can support the mission so we can advance the kingdom. And there's two ways to do that. We have our offering box in the back, and then we also have our online platform on, on victoryanaheim.org. Now, the last thing I'll say before we can go ahead and close this out in nice worship. So I want to share a little story, a little story that kind of goes hand in hand with our view of God and the gospel. And it's going to just, just follow along with me for a second because it may not seem like we're going to get anywhere. But trust me. So a couple weeks back, good news, my little brother got engaged. <laughs> You're not going to be clapping in a little bit because of what he did to me. He got engaged at the Grand Canyon. I am not the most fit man in the world, obviously. I, I love my Big Macs. But we had to go to the Grand Canyon. And I hiked all the way down. Felt like I was going down to like the bowels of like the, the pit, the abyss, because they just kept going down and down and down and down. And it got to a point where we had to go back up. It was great. He proposed. Everybody was happy. And I looked up, and I'm like, that is, that is very high. How am I going to do this? And I followed along with all my friends for probably a solid five minutes until I was like, <laughs> I vomited. I was sweating. It felt like I was about to see the Lord. I was like, Lord, take me. I'm so happy to see you. Oh, my goodness. Life is over. I get to be in heaven. But no, I'm still here. It was miserable. But the reason I share that with you is because that end point, that destination, that what I saw is like, oh, that right there is my salvation because I'm about to fall over and die, was so high up, so far out of my reach, and it was tiring to get there. I had to take so many stops. And the reason I share that with you guys is because we so often look at God in that same way, that we've fallen so far below and we look up to where God is up in the mountaintop and we think, this is going to be a heck of a climb back up. I'm not going to have the energy to do it. Or we go halfway and just like I was going halfway up the Grand Canyon, I thought, oh, I should just kind of peel over and die here because there's no way I'm going to get up there. But the thing that's the biggest difference between that and between the way that God actually is, is not this high up mountain. It's just turning around. God is right there, right behind you. There's no mountain you have to climb. There's no big Grand Canyon that you have to suffer because God is right there with you. So I encourage you as you walk forward in faith this week, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you will do in the future, no matter what you're doing now, all it takes is to turn around and repent and say, God, I I'm back. And he's right there waiting for you with open arms. So walk in that truth and walk in victory, church. Happy Mother's Day again, everybody. Uh, can we just uh, stand for one last song?
every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. Be blessed, church.